Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, scientists built a canoe using Stone Age technology to test whether ancient people really could have made a long sea voyage to islands in southwestern Japan. An enigmatic new dinosaur species has been discovered. Cheese does give you nightmares and much more. Our top story this week is a fascinating study that documents a group of scientists' effort to recreate an ancient kind of dugout canoe and paddle it across a vast stretch of water. This was done to test whether people 35,000 years ago could have made this journey. As early members of our species began to spread around the world after leaving Africa during the most recent Homo sapiens dispersal, they must have crossed large bodies of water to reach their destinations. For instance, migrating to Australia and New Guinea likely involved crossing the deep waters of eastern Indonesia. The first large-scale expansion of our species across oceans probably started around 50,000 years ago. And besides the Australasian voyages, there's also evidence of our species reaching a series of islands between Japan and Taiwan, the Ryukyu Islands. Archaeological sites on these islands date from between 35 and 27 and a half thousand years ago, indicating human presence during that period. Although sea levels were much lower then, these ancient humans still would have needed to cross considerable stretches of water to reach these islands. Moreover, these waters were especially treacherous, with one of the world's strongest ocean currents running through the seaway. Additionally, the islands are very low-lying, often invisible on the horizon from the opposite shore. Several hypotheses about how ancient humans reached these islands have been proposed, including the construction of bamboo rafts or reed bundled rafts. An alternative idea was that they created dugout canoes from large tree trunks. To test these different boat types, researchers made replicas using only tools available to Paleolithic coastal dwellers in Japan. They found that reed bundle rafts and bamboo rafts were unable to cross the strong currents, ruling them out as plausible means of transport. However, they had much more success with the dugout canoe. They cut down a Japanese cedar tree and hollowed it out with stone axes, then polished it using fire and stones. They attached thin bamboo sticks on either side and added leaves at the front and rear as wave guards. Five people then set out to cross from Taiwan to Yonaguni Island, paddling this prehistoric canoe through the powerful ocean current. The study provides detailed documentation of the voyage, describing their navigation using landmarks, stars, and the sky. The journey took a total of 45 hours and 10 minutes, during which they travelled approximately 225 kilometres, occasionally taking wrong turns, but ultimately succeeding. Although we cannot be certain that ancient people used this type of boat for these early ocean crossings, this experiment demonstrates that such a craft and paddling over these distances would have been possible. They would have needed to be skilled navigators and experienced paddlers, but clearly these prehistoric explorers managed to reach their destination somehow. A truly remarkable paper showcasing a brilliant example of experimental archaeology in action. In other news this week, a new dinosaur has been named. It lived during the late Jurassic period of Colorado and has been called Enigmacursa mollyborthwicke. As you may be able to tell from the name, this dinosaur is involved in a bit of an enigma. Enigmacursa is known from fossils uncovered in the Morrison Formation, a famous geological formation in the US that contains many well-known dinosaur species, such as Allosaurus and Diplodocus. Enigma Cursor is a small-bodied ornithischian dinosaur, so basically it's a little herbivore, but small ornithischians have a very convoluted history in the Morrison. To simplify it greatly, several names have been given to some of the small ornithischians in this formation in the past, but a very recent study found that none of them are based on good enough remains. Therefore, none of the previous names are valid anymore. And that's where Enigma Cursor comes in, as it does actually have enough diagnostic features to be recognised as a valid species. Enigma Cursor has leg proportions suggesting it was a fast runner, darting about the ancient Morrison ecosystem, and its existence shows that these particular dinosaurs were, in fact, 
quite diverse here, despite their poor fossil record. And now it's on display at the London Natural History Museum. Also in the Paleo News, researchers published an important study exploring the evolutionary origins and diversification of squid. Squid are fascinating animals. However, understanding their evolution has been quite difficult due to their soft-bodied nature, which means they rarely leave fossils. This new study employed a clever technique to detect squid in the fossil record, a method they call digital fossil mining. The researchers took concretions containing fossils from Cretaceous deposits in Japan and ground the rocks down layer by layer, taking photographs along the way. Although the rocks were destroyed, they obtained highly detailed digital models of the concretions that could be digitally cross-sectioned, revealing squid beaks, the hard parts of the squid body, that fossilize well. This improved documentation of squid fossils indicates that these animals originated about 100 million years ago, much earlier than we previously thought, and they rapidly diversified after this origin. The rise of squids might be related to the regional extinctions of belemnites in many areas, another group of cephalopods with internal shells that are completely extinct today. The study shows that early squids already had large populations, with their biomass even exceeding that of ammonites and fishes in the studied area. So, the Lake Cretaceous was truly a squid's ocean. Now, you may have heard the claim that cheese gives you nightmares, and it previously seemed like this was just a bit of a myth. Well, a paper published this week might actually explain where this belief has come from. Published in the journal Frontiers of Psychology, the paper details research in which over a thousand students at McEwen University in the USA participated. These students were asked about their sleep time, quality, dreams and nightmares, and then about their physical health, mental health, and their relationship with food. One of the study's findings was that lactose intolerance was heavily associated with nightmares and low sleep quality, which has been thought to be caused by gastrointestinal disturbance. There was much more fascinating data uncovered. For example, women were more likely to remember their dreams, have nightmares, and generally have a lower sleep quality, and twice as likely as men to report a food intolerance or allergy to the survey. In addition, whilst only 5.5% reported that what they ate could affect what their dreams were like, just under 25% thought that certain foods could make their sleep worse. So, a very interesting study which highlights a strong relationship between what we eat and how we sleep. And now, some news brought to you by the James Webb Space Telescope, as the cutting-edge orbital gold mine of astronomical discoveries has helped scientists get a new look at the emergence and evolution of disk galaxy throughout the universe and throughout time. Archival data from the JWST was used and a sample of 111 galaxies was created at a great range throughout space and time, going all the way back to just under 3 billion years after the Big Bang. Most disk galaxies today contain a thin, bright inner disk and a thicker outer disk. Previously, astronomers have had difficulty studying these two disks separately, as the inner disk outshone the outer one too much, but this is a problem that the JWST does not encounter. Data from ground-based observatories were also used, and it was found that the thicker disk formed in the galaxy first, before the brighter inner disk. When this happens depends on the galaxy's overall mass, with higher mass galaxies forming an inner disk sooner. There are three major hypotheses proposed that could explain this process, with the astronomers of this study pointing towards the turbulence gas disk scenario to be the one that fits with their data the most. A fascinating look into the history of our universe that has once again only been made possible thanks to the JWST. Finally for the news this week, researchers have published a study showing how a low-tech, relatively simple method could be highly effective for carbon capture. Literally, just burying wood. Removing carbon from the Earth's atmosphere is essential for limiting human-driven climate changes, and while a few CO2 removal techniques have been explored, this analysis indicates that burying wood debris from managed forests could potentially remove gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere. Instead of burning the wood debris or allowing it to decompose, which releases CO2 into the atmosphere, burying it under a couple of meters of soil could preserve the wood for hundreds or even thousands of years, largely preventing the CO2 release. 
according to the researchers' Earth System models, which focuses on managed forests, sawmills, and discarded wood furniture. Burying this wood could remove between 770 and 937 gigatons of CO2 between now and 2100. It's a seemingly simple method to capture significant amounts of the greenhouse gas, and the authors urge large-scale demonstrations to assess how this method might impact soil health and other factors such as biodiversity. A very intriguing new study. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at 7dos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Jibby Jibby Jabba Chappa, Clara Middleton, Dine Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prietprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrikas, Shlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.